Well, I'd like to ask you to join me now in welcoming Brother Roger J. Morneau, probably one of the most popular writers in our church, to our platform. Roger? Now, uh, we're going to start by explaining why we're having this interview in a sitting format. And my job, I think I ought to tell you right from the beginning so that you don't interpret that I'm being rude, I am here to both interview and interrupt. And the reason for that is, uh, Roger has written five books. Now, you have one wife, three children, 12 grandchildren, and your ministry as a writer really began when you were 57 years of age. Right. Uh, you didn't have any idea at that point that the Lord was going to begin uh, a national, international prayer ministry. That's right. And you're working on your sixth book yeah. right now. And a seventh. I got and two going you've got another one in your mind <laughs> that you're working through. Working at the same time. But um, uh, there have been a number of rumors that have circulated. When you first told me this, I thought you were kidding. Uh, and then someone called the Central Church and they said, we heard Brother Morneau's going to be there, but you haven't heard he's dead. <laughs> and so we want to begin by dispelling that rumor. <laughs> Um, but that, I think, maybe has grown from the truth that you have had some challenges with your health, and that's why we are going to uh, do this interview sitting down, right. and if your health and strength permits, you'll be able to visit the people. Tell us, right. where are you at now in your, in your physical state? Well, um, outside of my heart situation, I'm in perfect health. Uh, I do not have an ache or a pain in my body. <laughs> And uh, for those of you that have read my last book on prayer, when you need incredible answers to prayers, in chapter one, I talk about my being afflicted with pain in my left hip. Uh, my right shoulder was uh, freezing on me. The right heel of my foot, I could not stand on. And um, I had lower back pains, real bad. And besides, I had eternal problems. My uh, doctor told me, he says, well, man, I asked him, I said, hey, what do you think of the, the old guy? He says, well, I'll tell you what, I thought of your heart, he says, <laughs> you have a lot of other problems. And, uh, but he says, don't, don't worry. I have friends, they're surgeons, they do beautiful jobs. They'll fix your hip, they'll fix your inside, and they'll sew you up, man, and you'll be like new. And uh, I went home that day, <laughs> I didn't like the idea. <laughs> So at night, I, was, I woke up about 3 o'clock in the morning, that's four years ago, and um, my left hip was he, he hurting terrible. And I talked to the Lord, because it seemed that the Spirit of God impressed me deeply that the time had arrived in my life where I should ask the Lord for very special help. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked to our Heavenly Father and told him that uh, I love this prayer ministry to exalt Christ as the mighty redeemer that he is. And the lives of people are being blessed and benefited by the Spirit of God. But I said, Father, I'm to the point now where I have a hard time keeping my mind on what I'm talking about when I'm praying for people. You're in so much pain. Because of the pain. And I say, Father, would you honor me in a very special way? Uh, by the power of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that Paul talks about in, in Romans 8, 2. Uh, that, that same great power that raised up Lazarus from the dead be imparted to me through your Holy Spirit and to recreate my whole being to what I was about when I was 50 years ago. Now, I, you see with the Lord, let me tell you something about, about faith and asking for the Lord's blessings. Don't ever ask only for a half favor. Go all the way because he, he, is, he is mighty God and he's able to do anything. So I said, Father, I would like you to to, to reconstruct me, rebuild me, for the Spirit of God to rest upon me. And you see, Romans 8, 11 says, if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body, bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Mm -hmm. So I took that literally and said, Father, I am so thrilled that you are willing to do this for me. And I expect that within three days, I won't have an ache in my body. Now, Ellen White says in uh, Christ Object Lessons that uh, God longs, he longs to have us reach after him by faith. He longs to have us expect great things from mm -hmm. him. So I said, Father, I want some real, real great miracles here. 
And do you know, this was four years ago, and in three days I had no more pain nowhere in my body. But let me explain about my heart. I said, Father, about the heart, please don't touch it. Please don't touch the heart. Don't, don't, don't make me all better because, Father, I won't have a prayer ministry. I won't have one. I'll be flying all over creation telling people how nice it was to have had a prayer ministry. Mm -hmm. See, to have a prayer ministry takes time. You know, you get to pray. Uh, and with a bad heart, I get to rest a lot. So I pray a lot. And I have, uh, you know, right now I have over 25,000 names on my prayer list. Or as, as I would say in my prayer tower. You said That's the tower. right. It looks like a tower. World Trade Center. <laughs> in his I have like there. a seven-foot tower and that is full from top to bottom. There's over 1,700 letters in there. And then another tower is about half filled. And uh, the Lord uh, did for me uh, what I said to do. So outside of the problem with your heart, and your yeah. heart, your doctor said last exam is working at about 40%. Well, right? the doctor looked at me and he said, uh, how are you doing? My cardiologist. I said, fine. Is there supposed to be something wrong with me? No, he says, you know, he says, the, the part of your heart is dead and all that. He says, I'm concerned about it greatly, you know. He said, 1984, December 1, 1984, which is just 14 years uh, ago, uh, I landed in the uh, hospital in Niagara Falls, Canada, when Hilda and I uh, uh, drove her mother from central New York, where we were living, to Niagara Falls, where she resided, uh, she resided at the time. And uh, on Sabbath morning, 10 o'clock, I was taken into the emergency uh, uh, room at the hospital, and the doctor said to my wife, if you would have been 20 minutes later in getting here, you would have been dead, mm -hmm. your husband. So they find out uh, no time at all, especially Sunday morning, that uh, a, a virus had damaged my heart. And right at that time, the doctor told me later, uh, there was the, uh, the blood samples that they were taking at 6 o'clock in the morning was loaded with heart tissue which meant that the heart had started to deteriorate. When I asked him uh, on Tuesday, that was you know, from Sabbath uh, morning to Tuesday, I said uh, to the doctor, what is the possibility of my getting out of this place alive? And he looked at me and he said, you really want to know? I said, yes, because it's important. It will help me know how to pray correctly. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and said, you're a praying man. I pray for a lot of people. I'll pray for you from now on. You're taking care of me <laughs> like you are, you know. And he was a little taken with that. And he said, well, I'll tell you, it'll take a miracle. No, he said, you'll take more than a miracle to get you out of here alive. It'll take many miracles. I said, thank you, Doc. And that, that was it. Now, for those who have read my book, the very first book on prayer. Incredible answers. Incredible answers to prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, I have the story in here of my experience in the intensive care unit of the Great Niagara Hospital. Yeah. Let's go back to your conversion a little bit. Now, you're French-Canadian by birth. Oh, yes. And mm -hmm. during the World War II, you were in the Navy. Yeah. Now, just coming out of the Navy, some things happened where you got drawn into not passive, but outright demonic association, worship, mm -hmm. and the spiritualistic movement. Yep. Uh, tell us a little about that so um, folks know where you've yeah. come from. Coming out of the Merchant Navy, uh, I discovered there was thousands of uh, enlisted men that were looking for jobs even who were no longer in service. And to get jobs where in Montreal was uh, kind of difficult. And I took a, a job to get me uh, making a living at the Windsor Bowling Alleys and Billiards on, in West St. Catherine Street, which is the main street of Montreal. And uh, I was the assistant to the manager of the billiard room. That's where all the wealthy people, you know, play mm -hmm. billiard. And, so it turned out to be that one evening, about six o'clock, this fellow come walking in there and said, hey, Marno. I turned around and looked at him. He said, you're alive. I said, of course I'm alive. Yeah, I heard that you were torpedoed in the North Atlantic and that you died. You've had this problem all your life, haven't yeah, you? People I, I you're dead. <laughs> people so. misunderstand me. Yeah, he said, man, how nice to see you. And he you know, shook my hand. And yeah, he said, why don't you have dinner with me tonight? I've got a lot of nice, interesting things to tell you, man. Wow, my life is filled with, with well-being. I said, what do you do, inherit a, a few million dollars? No, no, it's better than that. Better than that. Can you do that with my weed? So I asked my boss, could I take the evening off? And it was like on Wednesday evening, there wasn't too many people there. Yeah, he said, you can't take it off. 
So we're sitting, you know, eating our meal, and he says, man, he says, let me tell you, I have become a member of a society who communicate with the spirits of the dead. How would you like to talk to the spirit of your dead mother? See, my mother died when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. I said, I wouldn't be interested at all. Hey, man, he says, I talked to my dad. He says, the things that he's doing is fabulous. These, these, the spirits of our departed loved ones are interested in our well-being here in this land, and they want to help you. Mm -hmm. they, want to, they want to be with you. They want to, they want to help you. So uh, he told me, well, you know, why don't you come to a seance with me next, next Saturday night? And uh, I said, no, I'm not interested, really, to be honest with you. And I tried to change the subject, but he wouldn't change the subject. He says, no, look, he says, you're chicken. I can't tell. He says, I knew more no, when, when he was afraid of nothing, you know. Uh, you, were, you painted the 70-foot uh, main mass on a ship. He said, nobody else wanted to go up there. And he said, now, he said, you're chicken. Or are you going to come with me Saturday night? I said, I'll go with you. And that's the way it started for about for a few months. We had dealt with these seances, and some many very interesting things happened. <laughs> if you want to hear about it, I'll tell you, but I think I'm better go now, on. Some of that is in one of your books. Is that in that, uh, Trip into the Supernatural? Or? Trip into the Supernatural. Right, okay. That's the one. That's it. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's called a plug. <laughs> you hold it in. Well, you told me that the cameras would pick That's it up, right? right? Yeah, you got to so hold, that... hold it for a little while, and then we'll yeah. put it down. That's good. Okay. Well, all I'm, trying, all I'm trying to do, I want to be recognized. People say that I'm dead. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can see that. <laughs> you can see my books, you see, and this guy's not dead, you know. So you, a number of fascinating things happened at these seances, yep. and, but finally, you actually got to the place where mm -hmm. at one point you, things were flying around the room and you were having uh, demons and spirits yeah. were speaking to the group and making promises. And I'm going to tell you a very short little story here. We go to one of these seances on Saturday night, sorry, Saturday evening, and there was a guest, uh, exorcist, whatever you want to call him, medium, uh, that was uh, speaking there. And um, my friend says, hey, by the way, this big, great uh, man, the band leader, mm -hmm. famous band leader is going to be there with his wife. I said, really? Oh, boy, I'd I, I like to meet him. Now, this, they, this man belonged to a, uh, a high uh, Luciferian Mm -hmm. Society of Spirit Worshippers. And um, what happened <clears throat> that the spirit had, this a spirit counselor that is one of Satan's top angels, had told the um, uh, high priest of the society just about a year before that the great master wanted to bring two individuals in to the society that would be a tremendous asset to the group in Montreal and had given our names, but the priest had forgotten all about that. And uh, what happened is, is that, uh, that this George, this uh, band leader, he was told by the, by the angel, you go with your wife to this seance. Uh, you look like you're really enjoying yourself, but you're there for one purpose, to bring these guys into the society, and here's, here's how you're gonna do it. When your wife is, engrossed with talking with the visiting uh, uh, medium. Mm -hmm. And you see that these fellows want to leave. You tell your wife that you're going home to rest, but she can come home with the Belengers, which live right just a few houses away. And the angel told him, walk out at the same time with the two fellows and ask them if they're driving or taking the streetcar. So we walked out of there, you know, and George says, hey, uh, listen, you guys driving? No, so we were taking the streetcar two blocks away. Oh, jump in the car. He had a nice big Lincoln, brand new one. We jump in the car, he says, I'll drive you there. And uh, on the way there, he says, hey, man, why don't we go to a fancy restaurant on West St. Catherine Street, and uh, we'll have a, some good food and a couple of drinks. And you tell me more about your merchant uh, experiences, see? So, okay. When, after we're sitting there, he says, how long have you guys been involved in sorcery. I said, what? Yeah, he said, how long have you guys been involved in sorcery? He said, you know the, the spirits, the, the supposed spirits of the dead? They're not the spirits of the dead. They're demon spirits. And they're deceiving everybody. And uh, they're of the lowest ranking of, of uh, 
uh, Satan's okay. angel. Mm -hmm. And he goes on telling us a little bit more, and he invites us to uh, one of their meetings for the following week, you know, for the Wednesday evening, and uh, the following e evening. But, you know, by the time we left there, he was so lit that I said to myself, this guy will never pick us up, you know, to go to this, this meeting. But sure enough, Wednesday evening, he gave us a ring, you know, to, well, my uh, friend lived about two blocks away from where I lived. But uh, he picked us up, brought over there, and introduced us to the... Uh, this, uh, the members of the secret society. And I was very amazed because of the fact that, that they were all professionals, mm -hmm. uh, merchants, uh, people, of, business people of, of great capacities, wealthy people, and there was a number of medical doctors and attorneys and people that Now at this point, you realized this risk. society, they were not just mediums doing seances, you knew that this was the mm -hmm. underworld. They had uh, beautiful paintings. Uh, life size mm -hmm. of angels that had appeared, Satan's angels, uh, dressed in different uh, garment of different ages, and they had materialized. First, they had materialized in, in those forms. Then they were photographed, and then they made pa the uh, paintings of them. And when I visited the uh, worship room of the gods, uh, I was amazed to see there was over a hundred of those beautiful paintings all around the worship room of the gods, and they were all. Uh, uh, Satan's top-notch uh, spirit uh, counselors. So they so, had these life-size paintings yeah. of demons that had once mm -hmm. appeared right, and they made angel. paintings out of them. We were so amazed, my, my uh, friend and I, we couldn't believe it. That, uh, you know, having been born and raised a Catholic and you think of the devil, you know, being in the middle of the earth and fire, you know, mm -hmm. covered with soot, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, they look terrible. <laughs> and uh, then you find out that, uh, you know, the great conflict that started in the courts of heaven. And the demons are beautiful. And the, the, the angels, uh, sins and angels are beautiful beings, bright, beautiful beings. Mm -hmm. See? The high priest told me that uh, when he was in Chicago visiting there, that an, an angel appeared to him. And he says the, the brightness was so great that he couldn't look upon the, upon the being, uh, but close his eyes. And uh, the spirit counselor, the angel, told him that... Uh, the fellow that he had left in charge, the other priest mm -hmm. in Montreal, was about to wreck everything that this, the spirits had done to bring my friend and I into the society. And that he ought to phone immediately and get this guy to change his mind. It, he had not, uh, when George wanted to phone him and says that, that he would like to bring us, he said, no way. He said, uh, if the high priest wants to have, him, have them here, He's going to have to be here himself, and that'll be in the future. Now, I remember reading that the spirits were offering different gifts and powers, and at one point, you received the power to get dreams about what horse to bet on. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you won. You, the bookies finally told you to stop coming yeah, because you yeah. won several days in well, a row. Is that they, right? They told me that they were going to put a bullet in me. So when I heard that, I said, the guy, I won't come back here. <laughs> but every yeah. race that you bet on, you won for several yeah, here's days. here's what happened. The high priest uh, uh, told us, my friend and I, that the great master would very much like to have us initiated into the society on the 31st of October at their uh, resort in the Laurentian Mountains, north of Montreal, north of mm -hmm. Saint Agathe. And uh, that, uh, you know, he, he wasn't able to tell us what the great master wanted us to do as a career, but that it was going to be a, a tremendous important work that the two of us were going to have to do. Well, my friend says, well, you want it to be, to, 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 to be initiated any time. But uh, I said to the priest, you know, uh, uh, at that time, you know, I didn't know very much. I said, my reverend, you know, I call the guy the reverend. I uh, understand how the great master may want us to be initiated now, but somehow I don't feel that I want to be initiated this time. What about maybe like in the spring of the year or something like that? He said, well, I'll tell you what, I don't know. He says, you, you don't, don't want to buck the good master, the high master, because the great master, because he says it's, it's very bad. So, he said, And Look. the great master is who? Is Satan. Okay, I just want to clarify that. The great yeah. master is Satan. Yeah. But is they still, offering they still refer gifts. to him as the great master or Lucifer. Or Lucifer, okay. We don't call him the, the Satan. Uh, there are very few reference, but very few. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, look, I'm going to do something for you guys, especially for you, Roger. I'm going to pray to the great master that he give you a gift. 
Why can't you? Like, and give three or four or five, and choose whatever you choose. It says will will be yours. And I said, well, you know, it'd be mighty nice if I had the gift of uh, clairvoyance, where I could see, uh, you know, uh, clairvoyance. Yeah. See at the, at the bouquets, you know, you play the horses. Uh -huh. You go to the bouquets and you see all the name of the horses and and the, the tracks, Belmont, wherever they were running. You see, and uh, and to know which was going to be the winner. I said that'd be great. It could make myself nice money. He said, that would oh, probably work with the stock market too. Then, you yeah, it would probably work with anything, you know. <laughs> but he said, he, he said that's yours. You, you got it. And sure enough, just a, few, uh, a little bit later, uh, I had a dream, and I dreamed that I went uh, that I went to the bookie, and on a Saturday morning, and the, uh, I saw like a calendar date and everything, and I saw the all the horses running at three different races, and the winner was the one that, that shone. It was shiny. So shiny. Mm -hmm. And that was one there. It was 21 to 1, this guy, this horse. It was so bad, you know, the possibility of, of winning was so poor that he was paying 21 to 1. In other words, if you put a dollar down, yeah. it, it, you get 21. See? Mm -hmm. He wins. Well, that was a shining one. I said, boy. Then I said, this other one, it, 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 uh, you, you look good. So I said to myself, well, you know, in those days, money was, was, was uh, you know, you, you scarce. Get, scarce. So I said, well, I'm going to put $2 on this guy, you know, so I put $2 on it, and then uh, he wins. That was first. Then I put, uh, I put uh, $20 on the 21 to 1 horse, and that one, and then that got the attention of everybody. Everybody said, I can't believe it. Some guy were knocking their, their heads, excuse me, knocking their <laughs> fist on the counter, <laughs> you know, because they, they said, this horse is totally worthless. He shouldn't have been in this race, and then he wins. You know, and so I was listening to these guys, and I said, boy, so you, you know what happened? When I came back there the, the, the following week, oh yes, I went out, I left out of there with a bundle of money in my pocket. I went down to the St. Catherine Street, I went to one of the fine men's store, and I bought myself a $200 suit. That's a lot of money back then. In those days, in 1946, yeah. a lot of bundle of money. So anyway, I came back the next week, and the uh, man at the cage says, you're Roger. I said, yes, as I was putting some money down. He said, uh, the boss would really like to see you. The bookie boss. Yeah, the boss, okay. the owner of the operation. And he says, you go to that door right over there. I said, okay. So he gives me my tickets and I go in there and knock. Come on in. You know, it was all in French, of course. <laughs> uh -huh. Entrez, monsieur. Oh, yeah, he sees me. Oh, you're the guy, you're Roger. I says, yeah. Come here, he says, sit down right there in front of my desk. He got up. And he walk around, make a big circle around me, look at me, sit back again, and he says, you don't look like a winner. You don't look like a guy, you don't look like a man that knows anything about horses. Well, I said, I don't. I just happen to be lucky. He said, I'll tell you what, I don't know where you're getting your information, okay? But I don't, we don't like it here anymore. You're taking too much of our nice money. So I'll tell you what, the next time that you're in here, I'll let some, I'll let some of my goons after you, and you'll put a bullet right up there, man, and I won't have you around here again. Now, if you want the, the, the address and names of different bookies in Montreal, I'll give you a whole list of them. I said, no, it's not necessary, sir. I won't, I won't come back. <laughs> so that he was knew, the beginning. He yeah. knew you had inside information. He just didn't know how inside it yeah. was. Right? So the pressure mounted, the pressure mounted to be initiated. And this was in October. And I came home on a Wednesday evening, and after the hypers had put a lot of pressure on me, and I, I went uh, to bed, but I couldn't sleep. About 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm, I'm sitting, laying in bed there. And now this was a prayer, mighty beautiful prayer, very short. And I never thought I was, I was praying. But here, listen to this. I said, if there's a God in heaven who cares for me, see that? Mm -hmm. Who cares for me, help me. I don't know how long I, I stayed awake after that, but the next thing I knew, my alarm clock rang. And uh, I got up and went to work. Something now, something beautiful happened. I am working in, in the embroidery factory, and I was working on my machine. And the the uh, three o'clock coffee break came in the afternoon. And, uh, I went out, outside to, to have my smoke, and uh, one of the bosses, you see, they were Jewish, uh, two owners. One of the bosses said, "Hey, Roger, uh, when you come up, uh, come into my office. I want to talk to you." I said, okay, so I came back to, uh, up, and he said, uh, "Come on in." Uh, close the door. I said to myself, what in the world is going on? He never closes his door unless he wants to fire somebody. You know, <laughs> I learned that by, by observation. 
I said, well, what's the problem? Well, there's no problem. But he says, I, well, he says, you could call it problem probably. You know, you, you notice this guy that was here th th this uh, morning that I showed around the shop? I said, yeah. I said, the black guy? Yeah. Well, he's going to start working here next Monday. And he's a Christian, but he keeps the, the, the Jewish Sabbath. What do you mean he keeps the Jewish Sabbath? Yeah, he keeps the biblical Sabbath of creation, that God created the world, the earth, and blesses the seventh day and all of that. Mm -hmm. He keeps it like the Jews do, like the Orthodox Jews do. So I said, so what? I want you to find out what denomination he belongs to. It's haunting me, this thing. He says, I, would, I, hardly, I could hardly sleep last night that I had to find out what denomination this guy belongs to. But he said, I'm not going to start doing this kind of work. He says, you're my friend. Give me a favor. Find out for me. I said, sure. No problem. And he said, I'll have him work on the machine next to you. So this is in the embroidery, embroidery factory. factory. He said, you're going to have a lot of chances to talk to the guy. But don't let him know that I'm the one that wants to know what denomination he belongs to. Okay, don't worry. So to cut long story short, my machine was breaking threads and I had to back it up and start over again. And I got very, very unhappy with the whole thing and I started to call the saints. I was a Catholic then. When I was a former Catholic, you know, I was calling the saints I down from heaven. And uh, <clears throat> so the coffee break came at 10 o'clock, went out downstairs and I was telling Cyril, I said, uh, have you ever seen anything like this taking place? The boss comes over, adjusts the machine, he works 20, 15, 20 minutes, thinking he's worked beautiful. I get back to the machine, the thread start breaking right away. I said, I don't know what it is. Uh, I said, do you have any suggestions? He says, well, I'll tell you what. He says, if I were you, I would take it easy on the Lord. I could hear you talking to the, 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 the saints up there a little while ago, but he said, and he said, I heard the name of the Lord, and I thought, seeing that you've asked my opinion, I, I, I like to tell you, take it easy on the Lord. Maybe things will go better. I said, to, I said to myself, there's my opening. I said, say, man, I understand you're quite a religious man. What denomination do you belong to? He said, I'm a seventh Adventist. A seventh dead. A, 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 a seventh, what? I said, I'm a seventh Adventist. And he explained what the name meant, you know. Wow, I said, this is interesting. It's interesting. And, and I asked him some, some other questions. And then uh, it was time to go back upstairs. I said to him, I said, look, did you bring your lunch? He says, yeah. What about us sitting on the, on the loading dock in the back of the place there and have our lunch together and you tell me more about your religious convictions, about his business of the Lord coming and you know, resurrecting people and recreating the earth later on and all of that. And you're not going to be just a spirit flying on a cloud in heaven if you're saved into God's kingdom. He said, yeah, you will talk about it. So we had a good hour talking. And in the afternoon, about two o'clock, the spirit started to oppress me. It was uh, in the month of October. The windows were open about maybe four or five inches in the plane. It was cold, cool, and I was starting to perspire. So I took my uh, shirt and uh, unbuttoned it and rolled my sleeves and I was still perspir perspiring more. So I went to the men's room and once I locked, I, I locked the door, I, I was being grabbed and choked. And uh, the pressure was so great that I stood over the, over the toilet and the water was just pouring down there. And I said to myself, unless Cyril's God help me, the spirits are going to do me in. And instantly, just... So you knew that uh, you had the demonic powers that were trying to choke you right then. And yeah. So uh, at 3 o'clock, <clears throat> no, it was at 5 o'clock, uh, I told him, I says, uh, what streetcar do you take? Why do you take the streetcar? He says, well, I'll take it about uh, two blocks down here. I said, I want to walk with you. Uh, listen, uh, if I went over to your house, could you show me in the Bible, uh, you know, the things that you were telling me today uh, about uh, your religious convictions? Oh, yeah, he says, I'd be glad to. I said, yeah, okay. Uh, he said, what about next weekend? Oh, no, no. I said, I mean, this evening. This evening? Oh, it's not a good evening. He says, I have a guy that's supposed to come and buy my jazz records. And he says, uh, you know, I've already promised him, put him off two or three times. I said, well, I'm sorry, but I surely would have liked to, to stay the Bible with you. He said, what about tomorrow night or the night after? I'll be too late, my friend. Too late. Forever too late. And he said, okay, you'll be, here at, at, be at our home at 7 o'clock. And uh, we'll be waiting for you. Now I get to his place and uh, introduce me to his wife and then he says, well, uh, I got to explain something to you. Edison, 
He said, you know, I'm not a Southern Adventist. Uh, actually, I told you it was a Southern Adventist because just, you, know, you asked me and I said it was the easiest thing for me to do. I didn't have a lot of time to explain. Uh, I'm not a baptized member of the Southern Adventist Church. I probably will be baptized for too long because I'm just about making my, my decision in regards to the Sabbath. But he says, my wife is a Southern Adventist. And he says, she will give us, uh, you know, she, she conduct the Bible studies tonight. If I said, okay with you. I said, yeah. And she explained that they had these little Bible studies, 28 Bible studies for Wednesday people. And on one sheet, which is represent one study, was about maybe 18, 20 questions. Mm -hmm. And then you look up the answer in the Bible. So I said, that's fine. So we had a first Bible study, the Word of God. And then it's 8 o'clock. And I said to Cynthia, uh, She's smiling now. Isn't that beautiful? She remembers that like it was yesterday. And it's 51 years have gone by. I said, Cynthia, what's the next Bible study entitled? Oh, that's Daniel 2. I said, yeah. What is it about? So he told me a little bit. I said, hey, let's have this Bible study right now. No, they said, why not come back maybe then next weekend? <laughs> no. I said, tonight, right now. So uh, several said, okay, let's have it. So now it's 9 o'clock. Oh, I said, what a fantastic study. Well, how interesting. And I said, what's the, the third study title? title? And she, she looked at several and uh, she said, it is such and such. I said, fantastic. Let's have, have the study also. I said, what time do you people go to bed? Oh, they said, we go to bed about 11 o'clock. But <laughs> after you, after, he said, after I listen to the evening news. Beautiful. I said, we have time for another study. <laughs> and he said, let me explain to you. We've got a pr real problem here. He said, you know, our minister has been giving us a lecture on how to give Bible studies effectively. And he tells us that we should never give people more than two Bible studies per week. And they should be like one, maybe like on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, and the other one like on Sunday you know, or Saturday or something like that. And he said, you know, we've already had, how many do we have now? Three? Mm -hmm. Two? Anyway. And he said, we've already passed our quota. I said, <laughs> I'm so glad that you told me that, Cyril, about your minister. I'll tell you what, I promise I won't tell him a thing. You know what I'm <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell him that uh, when I meet him that we had uh, three or four Bible studies the first night. Yeah, that's forbidden. We know that. That's right. <laughs> he said to Cynthia, you might as well go ahead, Cynthia. So Cynthia had another Bible study. Now, it was uh, uh, 10 o'clock. I said, was it the fourth one? He said, I won't tell you the name, the title. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I thought you people were really nice, loving Christian that wanted to help a poor lost soul, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and here you are, refusing to give me another Bible study. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said hey, I just think you can't, you know, figure this out. He said, what, hap what would happen if we didn't study tonight? I said, I'll tell you what, let me be uh, honest with you, okay? I cannot tell you the reason why I want all these Bible studies. But if I am back here tomorrow night for the fifth Bible study, it will have been a super miracle of God that I'm alive. Mm -hmm. Cheryl said, you make it sound like a matter of life and death. I said, it's exactly what it is. And I'll tell you later if things turn out good for me. I was as sure as I was sure that the sun's going to rise tomorrow, that the spirits were going to do me in that night. The high priest had told us about a couple of accidents that had happened to some of their members that had decided that, well, no, no, this is really not for me. One guy, you know, he, he told the high priest, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to excuse me from this uh, fellowship, he says, it's not for me. The, the guy says, wait a minute, don't you back off on, on the ma great master because it'll cost you your life. And he said, <laughs> that'll be the day. He went away and the, the, uh, uh, he left that day mm -hmm. from work and the uh, spirit counselor, the angel appeared to, to the high priest and said, the man is going to die in a car accident is, uh, down the road and he's going to be decapitated. And that's exactly what happened to him. So, uh, uh, you know, I knew very well that the spirits were already uh, well aware of what I was doing, and I was not going to be around very long. 
and you knew that, uh, or at least you believed, yeah. that if you went ahead and tried to leave this satanic society, that yeah. you were done in Cost for. Cost life, yeah. So, um, uh, that night I said goodbye, didn't expect to see them again. But the next morning I woke up, you know, and I, I was expecting some kind of an accident on the way home. But I woke up the next morning, man, life, you know, it's beautiful, my life. And uh, I had, uh, of course, get them, them to commit themselves to more Bible studies for Tuesday, you see, at least once. That was once. the next day? Next day. So the next day when I was there, we had four more. <laughs> you see? Now I was sure <laughs> that I was not going to see them on Wednesday. I shook hands with them and said, well, if I'm still alive, I'll be here tomorrow night for Bible study number 489. See, we had 28 Bible studies in one week, seven days. So, so what happened here? I'm getting ideas for a new evangelistic series. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> what happened here is that uh, uh, by Tuesday night, I was so sure that I would not live any longer. That uh, I figured... Well, it was nice to learn the truths, mm -hmm. truth about the Creator. Because the high priests always talk when, you see, they don't refer to God as God. They always refer to God as the Creator, always as the Creator. The great God is Lucifer, the great master. Yeah. So don't give glory to God for anything except that he's the Creator. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's the thing. Now, Wednesday when I came back from those Bible studies, I was so thrilled in my soul, I didn't know how to pray. But there was in my being an elation of such happiness toward the God who cared, you see? Mm -hmm. that I didn't know his name, but I knew that he's the God that cared. Because I said, if there's a God in heaven who cares for me, help me. So, we had two more Bible studies, and those Bible studies did for me marvels. By the time that the two other Bible studies were finished, we had four more, by the way, two more after that. But now I knew within myself that I had a great master also, and that he was way better than the great master that I had been serving for a while. Amen. And also I became very daring. I, de I determined right there and then that with the grace of the Lord Jesus and the power of God and his Holy Spirit, I didn't have to worry about the high priest and about the bullets, mm -hmm. and about the capitations to accidents. Now, let me interrupt you. How long ago was this? 51 years ago. And you did 27 Bible studies in one week. 28. You know, you've already heard Brother Morneau allude to it, but the couple that gave him those Bible yeah. studies is here with us tonight. Would it be all right if we asked them to stand up? Please, yeah. Uh, is it Cecil and Cynthia? Would you please stand yeah. up and show the Bible studies? Yeah. Come up on the step or near the step. Come up, come up a little closer. Come near the step. So Cecil is you. holding up. This is the set of Bible studies that he gave Roger yeah. uh, 20, what, over 50 years ago. Yeah, that's right, 51. And isn't that incredible? Boy, you needed a magnifying glass for these that's back right. then. That's right. The printing was very fine. I can no longer read them. You can't read them anymore. <laughs> They're too small. Oh, praise the Lord. That's, I think, remarkable how the Lord has preserved them. And I'm sure that this couple really did not expect that those Bible studies they were giving were going to result in a ministry that would be, in essence, touching the lives of uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. And so when you give a Bible study to one person, never underestimate what the long-term influence of that is going to be. Isn't that wonderful? So, uh, uh, this is about all I'm going to say about, about this part of it. Uh, on Wednesday night, I, I, when I got home, I had a letter in my, uh, a note on my door from my friend. Mm -hmm. On Thursday night and Friday night also. Because, see, I was, we were finishing our studies at 11 o'clock and it took me an hour to get home on, on the streetcar, which meant that I got home at 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. He had been around to try to talk to me, but he couldn't uh, get a hold of me. He didn't know where I was. And, but on f uh, Saturday night, he told me, he said, the high priest has informed me that the spirits are going to destroy you and there's a big price already been set on your, on your, on your head. You see? I need to talk to you, please call me. And uh, I decided there was a, there was a, a pay phone in the hallway uh, downstairs 
in, in the foyer, but I decided I'd better go to a restaurant on the street uh, so I can uh, talk privately. And uh, I called him up and he told me, he says, I got to talk to you, man. He said, your, your, your life is worth nothing. He says, you're, you're not going to live. He says, if you don't come back to the great master, he says, uh, tomorrow, this will be your last chance. And he came to visit me and he tried to convince me in, in two hours' time that I should come back to the society. I said, no, no, I'd be a loser. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you'd be a loser? He says, you'd be wealthy, you'd be famous, and you'd be doing a tremendous work that could benefit mankind. I said, I know exactly how sin benefits mankind. And uh, beside that, I said, I got a new master, <laughs> and he's super wealthy. <laughs> and beside that, not only does he promise me gold and silver in abundance after the resurrection, the first resurrection, Amen. but he promises me a hundred million years of living plus. Mm -hmm. And he's told me that this is going to be just the beginning of the good life. Amen. <laughs> so my friend looked at me and he says, you're either crazy or you're telling an awesome truth. And I said, I'm not crazy, but I'm telling you an awesome truth. Now, I'll tell you why I cannot go and see your, your great master, I mean, the, the high priest. Mm -hmm. Because the high priest had promised that he would make everything right with, 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 with the great master. And I'll tell you also the reason why I'm not afraid of bullets or threats of any type. Let me show you something. I walked over to a table where my Bible, I had read for my uh, devotions that morning, uh, the experience of... Uh, uh, Zechariah and Sennacherib, you know, the great mm -hmm. uh, Syrian king, uh, uh, general, who had come up, you know, to Jerusalem. And, right. Uh, and uh, Zechariah brought the letter before the Lord and told them exactly what uh, they intended to do. And the Lord says, we'll take care of them. And you know, uh, I think it's 280,000 men were killed in that instance. Or 180,000? Yeah, about 180,000 people okay. died in their sleep. You knew that the same way that Sennacherib was threatening Jerusalem and the life of Hezekiah and Hezekiah took the problem to the Lord and he protected Jerusalem yeah. and destroyed the enemy. God yeah. would do that for you. That's right. And uh, the Lord still does that today. And now you've got a prayer ministry around the world. Uh, one of the questions that comes in, and we're going to dedicate the second half of our program in a little bit to questions that you are sending in, but a very common question is, uh, your, your prayer life seems so powerful and effective and folks are wondering what do you have that's different than the average person? I was talking to Karen last night mm -hmm. and I said I think after a person has seen the power of the devil it's so easy to believe in the reality of God mm -hmm. and you, you know that it's real and I'm on, in the same way you cannot be a real Christian without to some extent believing in the existence of the devil. And uh, there's a spiritual battle that's raging, and you're aware of that. And so when you pray, you know there's someone listening. Right. And faith is one of the most important elements. Yeah. I was in terrible needs of the blessing of God in my life. Because I knew that, you know, I had powerful enemies that were after me to destroy me. So my relationship with Christ every day, when I first opened my eyes, was to raise my mind to the holy of holies of the heavenly sanctuary and take four or five minutes and tell the Lord Jesus how happy I was that I'm alive. And I've been doing this for 51 years. And um, my relationship with Christ has grown because of the fact that he blessed my life in so many little ways. And that's what amazed me most, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that God can make great miracles, but to, for God to make a lot of little miracles right along to keep you alive and to enable you to, to keep the biblical habit of creation. Yeah. Now I'm going to bring you back to one of those great miracles you touched on. When you were in the ICU, the intensive care unit, yeah. with your heart problem, mm -hmm. you prayed for everybody on that floor, yeah. and one man in particular um, had an unusual answer to prayer, Mr. Smith. Why don't you yeah. tell us about that answer to prayer real quick? Okay. Um, I was brought in there, like I said before, Sabbath morning, 10 o'clock. I was very, very low. After they had all, you know, wired me up and did whatever needed to be done. <laughs> and then they told me that my wife could see me only two, uh, 10 minutes every two hours. I said, that helps me <laughs> a lot, <laughs> you know. So, great deal. So anyway, that um, 
Sunday evening, I was still alive, and I saw the, the see there was 14 glass tin units, rooms, with people in there, was filled right up. And because of great emergencies, there was three beds right next to the nurse's station, and I wasn't one of those. And I could hear what was going on uh, between the nurses talking. And uh, the head nurse says, I think I'm going to have to call for more help. The people were getting into crisis situations. And an elderly man, about 80 years old, next to me, you know, they had to have two nurses to keep, just to keep him from choking up and dying. The nurse said to the young nurse, you know, you say, we've got to do it. That's what we're here for. You know, and, and the, the young nurse, well, you know, she, she, they had to try to keep him breathing. So cut a long story short, but I listen, I see all of these people here, and all of a sudden, the thought entered my mind that in 1946, the high priest had said that Satan and his angels love to see people die, to see humans die, and especially in times of war, and when they have great battles and a lot of people die, they have a celebration over it. And those words came back to my mind like if it were yesterday. See? And I said to myself, there's a lot of people who are not going to make it tonight. And I raised my, my mind to the Lord. Because when I talk, I, I just a little bit oh, above the whisper, you know. <clears throat> I was that low in strength. And as a matter of fact, to turn my head on my pillow, I had to make a concentrated effort just to be able to look at the monitor. Mm -hmm. That was going 228 times a minute between mm -hmm. 200 and 228. And um, I started to pray. I said, Lord Jesus, you know, it's a sad, sad thing to see these people here in this land of the enemy. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all going to go to a grave sooner or later. But I believe there's a lot of people who are not going to make it here tonight. And I'm afraid that they're not prepared to raise in the first resurrection. And because of the fact that you've already paid the sacrifice for, for their salvation, and that the, sacred, uh, the medicine of your sacred divine blood is available to be appropriated to them. And in, by in my asking for special help, see that's what's beautiful about uh, being an intercessor in this land of the enemy. Uh, the plan, the super plan between, uh, uh, that, well, the rules of engagement of the warfare are such, I get it to understand from what the Spiritist priest had said and from what I read in the Bible and writings of Ellen White, that God depends on us tremendously to ask for help for others mm -hmm. inside ourselves. Because when we do this, then the Spirit of God and his angels can move into Satan's domain and legally take care of a lot of bad situations. Mm -hmm. But if we don't ask for this help for ourselves or for others, Satan and his angels says, hey, you have no business being here. Get back there. Right. You're ours, you know. So. And uh, as I was praying that the Lord would uh, make these people better and get them out of here, if it wasn't going to be, uh, you know, within a few days, to get them out of this hospital and give them a second chance, you know, to be able to, to draw an eye to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, Lord, I don't know these people's name, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to pray that you will every day. I'm going to pray that their sins and equities be forgiven them and that you would uh, appropriate to them the medicine of your sacred bloodshed on Calvary for their salvation. And Lord, I promise I'm going to be doing this for a long time. And I said, you, get it, you, you give them a chance, give them another chance. Mm -hmm. And things blew up wild. It went wild. It went terrible. More people were, were having distresses and perplexes and, and difficulties. And then the nurse uh, got over the last speaker. She said, I need more nurses. Come and help. And all of a sudden, a man in Unit 9 by the name of Mrs. Smith, his heart stopped. And when the heart stops, something takes place there at the nurse's station. Uh, either it's a buzzer or a light. I can't, yeah, I don't remember what it was. But anyway, uh, the, oh. nurse, the nurse said to all doctors, please come and help. Uh, and she would give some kind of a code. Code blue. At least here something it is. Like yeah. So anyway, the three doctors came rushing in right into the door was head so that the unit nine was right in front of the door. They came right to their cube, ran in there. They had the resuscitator at the other end of the unit. The nurse had ran to get the thing. They worked on this man for about 10 minutes. And one doctor came out and he says, he's gone. You'll never bring him back. And uh, what happened, I said to the Lord, dear Jesus, before I die, see, 
I would very much appreciate that you would let me see the power of your resurrection at work mm -hmm. by causing the heart of Mr. Smith to be started up again and Lord that you make it well and that he be able to live a number of years because Mrs. Smith is, 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 cries all the time. Mm -hmm. She held always in that little waiting room mm -hmm. and Mrs. Smith was there also and uh, she had told him, she said, my wife said that uh, I have a praying husband, you know, <laughs> and she said, could you have your husband pray for, for my husband? So I said to the Lord, please, let me see the power of, of your resurrection. Immediately a shout went out. There was three nurses in there in that room, two doctors, and then Mrs. Smith told me four days later, when I talked to her and her husband on the cardiac floor, that the nurse had just pulled a sheet over her husband's head when he sat up in bed. <laughs> he sat up in bed, and then the women, even Mrs. Mrs. Smith, she, could, she said, I couldn't help it, and just, just, <gasps> just whatever she did, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, uh, he said, What's the, what, what, are you, what are you, all you people doing here? Well, the doctor said, well, you know, you were having a little trouble with your heart. We were, we were trying to help you. <laughs> oh, he said, I have a problem with my heart. He says, my heart is good, but I need some food. I haven't <laughs> eaten here in three days. <laughs> and Mrs., uh, 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 Mrs. Smith, I told Hilda, that her husband had decided he wanted to die. So he didn't, he hadn't eaten for three days and not even drank, huh? Didn't even drink for three days. He wanted to die. Because he had enough of this business with the heart, <laughs> you know. So uh, he lived five years after that. And I understand he became a Christian after that, is that right? Oh yeah, and, and from what I gather, yeah. And their, their daughter, uh, from, my, from my gather, uh, read uh, my book, Attributed to the Supernatural. So we still yeah. see resurrections, don't we? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. God does that. Yeah. Now, what is your, a lot of people here may want to know, what is your favorite passage in the Bible? Do you have a favorite? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm going to have to talk a little bit about my personal relationship with Christ okay. in order to explain this. You see, after I became a Seventh Adventist, I was working in the shop and uh, the unions were coming in. And uh, they were going to force some people to work on Saturday because of some special arrangement that they had. And I told the boss, you know, I'm sorry, but I have to quit this job. The, the difficulties are getting too great for, for, for me because, you know, they had to come to my place and I tried to bust the door down once and I had enough of that. And uh, that's before I was married to Hilda. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't good. So after we got married, uh, Hilda and I, in 47, um, I decided that I was going to give up the plane, which it is, and go into selling. Now, let me tell you something. My dad was a businessman, had trucking, uh, the transport from New Brunswick to Montreal, uh, Quebec, and uh, in sales, you know, made a lot of money. But I couldn't sell ice cream in July, you know? <laughs> that's, that's, that's how poor I was as a salesman. So I said to him, uh, when I was growing up, I said, never in the world will I ever be a salesman. And I said that to myself many times. But you know, once I got this, uh, thinking about this, and I was looking for jobs in Montreal, I said, when I give, give this job up, I better go into sales. So I told the Lord, Lord, I need to be able to keep the biblical habit of creation. I need your, your blessings. In sales, you'll be able to control things. So that on Sabbath, I can go to church and thank you for the glorious experience of seeing your Holy Spirit work so that Roger Moore can make a living in five days and be able to be in church on Sabbath with his wife and the child, the little boy that came up two years, another year later after that, 48. So um, the Lord started to work in my behalf. I was the, what you would call my boss said when he said, you know, you're a silent salesman. <laughs> Because I was with the Yellow Pages for about 20 years, you know, selling telephone directory advertising. It's, it's a tough business. Because you can't go to people that spend tens of thousands of dollars on radio and TV and newspapers and magazines and billboards and all kinds of other things. And when it comes time to list their names in the Yellow Pages, all this, they say, all I need is a bold type. Everybody knows me. You know? And you can never dis sell and display advertising. But I uh, talked to the Lord before I went to this business and said, Lord, you are able to create within the hearts of people a desire above anything else they've ever desired in their lives to buy big ads from Roger Mona <laughs> so that I can make money, pay my tithe, you know, 
help with some offerings and be able to, to be in church on Sabbath and have money left beside. And that's what the Lord did for me. Now, how long did you do that? How long were you at a well, The last sale five machine? years, I was division sales manager for the Continental Telephone System in the Northeast United States, covering eight states. I was in charge of uh, people there, mm -hmm. you know, that, that region. But for 15 years, I was a, a salesman. And you know, for instance, in Buffalo, you took the 31st best salesman they had in Yellow Pages and offered them to transfer to Buffalo in 1968. And uh, my division manager told me, he said, man, would I ever like to see you uh, put a transfer to Buffalo. He said, he said, he said, you know, he said, you're my glory. I said, what do you mean you're glory? Yeah, he said, man, you know, I hired you just at the time that the company had decided not to hire any more people that had, didn't have a college, college education. And he told me about that. <laughs> he had fought it with the vice president of the company that uh, he had this man that he felt was going to be, do a super job for them. And now, I was always in the upper court, court of Salesforce, regardless of where I went, whether it was, you know, in Syracuse, in different areas, working in telephone directories. And he says, why don't you put a transfer for a, a Buffalo? So why, I sent one in, and I was accepted. There I was, 31 telephones, uh, and 31 uh, uh, premise uh, salespeople, mm -hmm. and, 30, uh, and 11 telephone sales girls that took care of the doctors and lawyers and the different repeal. And in, in, at 1968, in Buffalo, New York, a four and a half by four ad sold for $411 a month. Now, when you go and see a, a business person that spend, like this one guy I have in mind, a tire dealer, he spent $91 a month. He had a one inch informational here and a couple of listings there and something else. And then you, you come in there with, with a four and a half by four ad. This guy looks at you and he says, are you crazy? You're going to try to sell me this thing? I said, oh, no, 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 I just want to show it to you. just wanted to show it to you. He says, well, he says, I am not interested. He says, the pros have been here before you, he says. <laughs> the pros have been here for a number of years. They've never been able to sell me telephone break advertising, display advertising. To me, it's, it's worthless. I said, am I ever glad that you told me that? Tell me the way that you feel about it. Because I have some news for you, good news. Do you know that your Yellow Pages telephone direct advertising has been recognized now by the federal government, you know, uh, they wrote books on how to establish and, and, and operate small businesses. And they say in all of their books, make sure that your first and most important advertising is to list yourself with a display ad, if possible, in the telephone yellow pages. Because that's where people go when they decided to buy. <laughs> they want to go there to refresh their memory to some competitor's address or phone number, whatever it is, and they see your nice display ad and they say, hey, let's try this guy, <laughs> you know. So I said, it's a form of business insurance. Business insurance, huh? So he picked up the thing, looks at it. You know, I never thought of it that way. Did, did you did do this work yourself? I said, yes. And he says, you're, you're, you're a pretty sharp guy. Well, I said, I've been working at it for a long time. I'm pretty nice ads. Wow, I like the way you set this up. Hey, hey, Joe, come here. Call his brother, you see. Joe, come. Look at this ad, yellow pages. Joe says, are you going crazy? You gonna buy that? You know, I just wanna show it to you. I'm not gonna buy it. <laughs> so, so you see, I'm the silent salesman. My boss he came with me sometime and observed me. He said, you know, you give the guy a couple of good reasons why you should have the ad and you should come out. And he said, you know, I can't figure that out. He said, I would have jumped there a dozen times. You see, after, after I had sold the guy the big ad, I'm talking about some other cases now, that he had been with me on the job. After we got out of there, and he says, man, he says, let's go down the street, talk about this thing. He says, this is miraculous. Did you see how this guy bought your ad? You didn't even open your mouth? You say anything of importance? I said, that's right. If I talk too much, I wouldn't be able to make five closes per day. You see, because there was not only a top producer in, so, in Greece. When they thought you were silent, were you praying? That's right. <laughs> I said, Lord Jesus, here's one of those fat guys. He's got a lot of money. You're probably never going to use it all. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and some kid is going to inherit this thing, you know, and blow it. And you know, all I now I need is a little part of it, you know, like four hundred eleven dollars a month. <laughs> See, so would you, Lord, uh, surprise me again? I, I always told the Lord, I said, "Lord, you surprise me again, Lord, and your Holy Spirit create within the heart of, of this guy a desire to have that ad above anything else ever desired, and I keep him out of it." And I, then I tell him, I thank him for what he's done before. See. And then uh, all of a sudden, the guy says, "Look, good Joe, I'm I, I'm going to get this ad this year." I want it because I want it. I can't give you a good reason why I want it, but I want it. 
Is that good enough for you? The brother walks away and says, do whatever he wants, your money. You know. So I write a big ad, you know, where the guy had one inch information on some listings. Now I walk out of there with, you know, a display ad. And that's the way that the Lord worked for me over the years. Now, you started telling me about your favorite scripture. Are we still heading there? Oh. That's right. Yes. Yes. We're, we're. Now, you see, I have found this out by experience. That uh, <clears throat> the Holy, we need the blessing of the Holy Spirit in our lives to be able to succeed in anything we undertake, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Ellen White says that the mark prosperity which accompanied everything placed in Joseph's care was not the result of a direct miracle, but his industrial care and energy were crowned with the divine blessing. So that's where the success is. So I want the divine blessing. So I pray to my heavenly father and I say, if the, the father, you know, uh, I need to be made wise, intelligent, harmless as a dove, and as wise as a serpent. And in, in this sale business, otherwise I, I, I won't make it. And I need your Holy Spirit to bless me and, and to make me uh, smart, mm -hmm. you see, enough to sell. And of course, I was directed to the crucifixion of Christ by Ellen White, writing her, reading her writings. And I have found by experience that if you acquaint yourself with what Christ has done for us to purchase our redemption, if you acquaint yourself with the mighty love that he had for us, and if you acquaint yourself with his power, your faith is going to grow. And faith is a beautiful thing. You know, Jesus had gone out on evangelistic uh, tour with his disciples. Mm -hmm. And we're told that he raised the dead and did so many things, you know. He healed a lot of people. But when he came back to Nazareth, the people in town says, I can't believe that. All these miracles that he did. Isn't he the son of, of Joseph and, you know, and, and, uh, or Mary and his brother and his sisters are here with us, you know. Uh, and the Bible says, Matthew 13, 58. He did not many mighty works there because, because of, their of their unbelief. Mm -hmm. Now, I've studied this matter of unbelief and this matter of faith. And I found that in the, the fallen nature of man, we have in our nature a, a, a capacity to distrust God and be very unbelieving. That's what is natural for us to do. Faith is to build confidence, our confidence in God. How much confidence in God would you like to have? Well, it's all built on, the, it's all to be found in the power chapter of the Bible, which I call the 27th chapter of Matthew. See? Mm -hmm. And uh, as I acquainted myself with that power chapter, and that I saw the Lord work marvelous, miraculous ways, and to see my faith increase, the Lord could do greater things for me and, and, and to bless the lives of others. I said, this is it. See, Ellen White says that what is needed, now this was at the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. She said, what God's people need right now is to have a living faith. And she explained it. She said, a living faith is a faith that will give you an increase of spiritual strength and will sustain in you an unfaltering trust in our Heavenly Father and in the power of His Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of faith I like. So I said, the Lord, I need this kind of faith. Now I started to, to acquaint myself with these beautiful words. And I would like to quote a few words from Matthew 27. Now, now you've memorized the 27th chapter of Matthew. What verses? Verses 24 through 54. Okay. That will take you from, uh, from uh, Pilate's judgment hall and bring you to Golgotha, where Christ expired on, on the cross. And you will hear there a centurion and his soldiers, pagans, say that truly this was the Son of God. Mm -hmm. Then after I quote the verses, if you want to, I'll quote you a little bit of Ellen White, says that happened there, okay? Okay. Now, the Bible says that when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing with the Jews, 
but that rather a tumult was made. In other words, a riot had begun. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See it to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe and planted a crown of thorns and put it upon his head. And they read in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked, uh, after they had done that, they took their robe off from him, and put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, and parted his garments, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And above his head was an inscription saying, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priest, mocking him, saying, uh, If he is the Son of God, let him deliver him. Then we will believe. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man called it for Elias. And straight away one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on the reed and gave him to drink. Some of the others said, let's see if Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion, and they that were with him watching Jesus, saw the earth quake those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. That's it. Amen. Amen. And praise the Lord. You know, that's where the power is. That's where the power is. It's in the cross. And I'll tell you what. Now, you recite that almost every day, don't you? Every day. Every day. Uh, if, uh, excuse me. Sometimes I'm pressed for time like any other people. I have people that are dying and need help. Mm -hmm. And I got to get on the phone and I, I, got, I, I got to, you know, help, uh, encourage. You and pray all with that. them. So I tell people... See, when I write everybody that I answer a letter to, reply a letter, tell them how we're going to pray for a loved one or for someone, I always mention the 27th chapter of Matthew, is the power chapter. And uh, there I tell them, if you're pressed for time and you don't see the possibility of reading the entire 30 verses, read at least the last 10. Okay? Mm -hmm. And to doctors and people that have definite appointments, they have to be, you know, in the operating room at 7 o'clock, whatever it is, I've had, I've had a number of physicians write to me and say, my, my Christian experience, I'm so dissatisfied with myself and I can't blame myself really in a way because of the fact that I, I've sold myself to the benefit of mankind and I have to be there to help. But how could I, how could I help myself to, to have a closer communion with Christ? And I write them some of these uh, things I'm telling you here tonight. And I have them call me back and say, man, what a beautiful thing. Now, they, now you see, what I tell my, my readers is this. 
I'm going to give you a formula for successful, victorious Christian living that will not fail you. And if you do this, now you're going to have to read a fair amount of verses every day from the Bible, but if you do this for one year, I can assure you that you will never be the same person. Mm -hmm. The reason being that you will be given an increase of spiritual strength as you do this thing. And by the time that 365 days have gone by, you have memorized yourself 30 beautiful verses on the life of Christ in our redemption. Mm -hmm. The crucifixion. And you know something? I have so many people writing back three months later, six mm -hmm. months later. Oh, they say, thank you, thank you, thank you. You can't, they, they, hey, they just don't slow down. They praise the God and, you know, and thank me and uh, which I don't believe. Well, I know that the power for revival is in the word. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And if the power for revival is in the word, what part of the word would be the most uh, potent? It would be the scenes of the cross. Yeah. And if a person could uh, saturate themselves with that every day, and I can see even though you have recite this in your private devotions and maybe when you visit with others, it still moves you every time you oh, say yes, it. Yes. That's because it's not just the words, you, you know the person that was hanging on that cross. Before I quote these words before, uh, in front of people, I have to pray. Because I used to cry all the time. In the middle, I used to break down and cry. That'd be okay. But uh, I say, Lord, you know, it's not going to benefit anybody to see an old guy cry. <laughs> so would you help me tonight as I quote my favorite verses of the Bible, that your Holy Spirit is going to sustain me so that I, I won't break down and cry. Well, you know, it's important that it yeah. moves you oh, yeah. if it's going to move others. Yeah. Uh, there have been some rumors circulating that you wish that you... We already talked about the one about your being dead, and we yeah. know you're very much alive now. But uh, <laughs> some of the other rumors, uh, for instance, I understand some people thought you no longer believe that the wicked will be cast into the lake of fire. That's what they said. <laughs> I didn't say it. Yeah, the, I got this doctor that called me. In 1993, Hildo and I had, uh, you know, the enjoyable experience of having five medical students from Loma Linda University visit us in our home. And these young people had read my books and they had underlined things and they were full of, intense, of, of a great intensity of desire to seek a closer walk with Christ. And they taught me that I could uh, help them. And uh, now they're all, you know, they, they all graduated and they're in practices and things. And one uh, doctor wrote me about a month ago. And he told us how happy he was that he admitted that that, that trip, seven hour trip you know, from Loma Linda mm -hmm. to uh, uh, where I live. And he said then he had, he, but he felt uh, sorry about what people are saying about me. Especially that um, they, they said it's been said that you do no, no longer believe in the destruction of the wicked as the Bible says it will take place. And it, you have also said that God will just put the wicked to sleep and that'll be it. And if you have said these things, will you give me the reasons why you feel that way? And I phone him up and I says, it's just people trying to... Uh, to uh, discredit your books. And discredit start my book. rumors. Yeah, and, and, my, and my prayer ministry and all of that. Yeah, you know, the devil is never more frightened, and this is, I think, a spirit of prophecy quote, than when God's people pray. And if you're doing a work to encourage people through your ministry and through your books to get people praying, that makes the devil tremble. And you can expect that he'll circulate uh, rumors and cause problems to discredit. For instance, I understand some are saying that uh, now you're perpetrating the philosophy of the New Age movement. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got this letter from a lady who told me I am sending you this letter because of the fact that I feel that you should really be made aware of a problem that is taking place in the minds of some people. Uh, that you are now shifting your emphasis to the new age ideas. And, uh, she, and, 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 and she's on a line in red, this part of the letter, where this lady says, what is this now, Roger Morno, you know? he." says that we should pray that God will surround us with a glorious heavenly atmosphere of light and peace. And he says, and she said, 
I never heard of anything like that being taught in the Adventist church. So he's drifting, you know, and, and she had other points and all that. You know. So what is happening is this. I had uh, written in my book, and, and I use a lot of spirit prophecy writings. Uh, Helen White says that, uh, uh, for instance, that there's a, uh, an article in Testimonies, Volume 8, where the servant of the Lord in five pages, it's entitled, The Power Promised. And she says, uh, uh, God does not ask us to do in our own strength the work before us. He has made divine provision for all emergencies to which our human resources are unequal. Mm -hmm. He gives the Holy Spirit to help in every street, to strengthen our hope and assurance, to eliminate our minds and purify our hearts. Christ has made provision that his church shall be a transformed body illumined with the light of heaven, possessing the glory of Emmanuel. And it is his purpose that every Christian shall be surrounded with a glorious heavenly atmosphere of light and peace. So this lady here... You're just quoting the spirit of prophecy. That's right. This lady here really had not read my book. But somebody had told her about it, probably. And she said, wow, this is new age. You know? Yeah. And she was very, well, very distressed. It's very easy for a person to uh, <laughs> leap upon one ambiguous phrase and try and make something out of it. You know, uh, we're just about out of time for this section. And I'd like to remind all of our guests that are here tonight that we have, we're providing in the second half, uh, however the Lord leads, opportunity for you to ask questions via writing them on the card. It's too hard to get audio microphones to everybody. So if you have questions you've written down on those cards that we've provided, you may have personal prayer requests. And Brother Morneau is going to take these home and add them to his prayer list. And I believe that uh, he could go on all night and tell you the miracles of how God has turned things around in people's lives on his prayer list. If you would like to write a question down for a second section and uh, pass them to the aisles, we have ushers that will bring them up to Mike, who's our production assistant. He'll bring them out. We're going to give Brother Morneau a brief break and let him uh, take a deep breath and drink water and... Uh, Maybe we'll have Don come out and we'll sing a song so we could stand up, stretch, and breathe. Some of you may have to leave. We hope that you're able to stay by because we think the miracles and some of the best reports are yet to come. But uh, at this time, before we conclude this section, if you have any questions, write them on your card or a special prayer request for Brother Morneau. And I'd like to ask if you could close this section by asking for the Lord's blessing on the people who are here, those who are watching. and. Uh, that we could all have a revival in our lives. Would you please lead us in prayer? <clears throat> our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our great Redeemer, we love you so because of the fact that you are our problem solver. Uh, you have gone the way of Calvary and purchased our redemption at such a great cost. Lord, we want to thank you for what you've done for us, and we pray uh, for a closer walk with thee. Mm -hmm. a, a, a beautiful... Uh, uh, experience of seeing uh, God's Holy Spirit, your representative on earth, do marvelous things to bring glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, bless everyone here present uh, and, and give us all a new beginning, so to speak. Amen. Because you are soon to come, Lord Jesus, and we want to have lived for you in mighty, glorious ways, giving you the, the chance and the opportunity by the faith that you will impart to us to see your Spirit do wonderful miracles of divine grace. Mm -hmm. Bless us, we pray, to the glory of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in thine holy name. Amen. Amen.